Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Paul Goodwin. I'm a trustee of the Africa Centre. Um, and we're really, really happy and proud to welcome Professor Hakim Adi to the Africa Centre. And I'm going to brief, how, what, we'll, what we'll do today is that I'll briefly, very briefly introduce um, Hakim. Um, Hakim will then give um, his wonderful lecture uh, or discussion with some images. I think he's showing some images. Um, for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we'll open it up for you to basically engage with um, Hakim about, about this wonderful text and the research and the work and the ideas that have been driving um, this work. So just a little bit about um, Professor Hakim Hadi. So Hakim is Professor of the History of Africa and the African Diaspora at the University of Chichester. And one of the most important things about that is that Hakim is the first historian of African heritage to become a professor of history in Britain. I remember that was at um, Middlesex University back in the day, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you, you carry on and say what you want. You tell your history. I'll tell, my I'll tell mine. <laughs> I, I thought it was at Middlesex. No, they rejected me twice. Oh. Was it once? Well, you, but you started at Middlesex. I did start. Indeed. I, that's what I was thinking. Got that bit right. Okay. So Hakim trained as a historian of Africa, but his interests have also broadened out to include the history of Africa um, and the, history, the African diaspora. Hakim's earlier research and publications focused on the history of the African diaspora in Britain, <clears throat> which was at the time, and argue, perhaps even um, to a certain extent now, a relatively new subject for academic study. And in particular, um, Hakim focused on the political history of West Africans in Britain. And this work really sought to demonstrate not only the important links that were established between those on the African continent and its diaspora, but also that Africans and those of African descent have played a significant but often neglected role in the history of Britain, which I believe is the subject of, um, of Hakim's text. So although focused on Britain, Hacking's work has also had an international, global dimension and is focused on, on in organizations such as the West African Students Union, which was necessarily um, international in scope. Um, and it led to further research and publications on the history of Africans in Britain, as well as on the history of Pan-Africanism and the influence of communism. Yes, communism. <laughs> um, on the struggles of those in Africa and the African diaspora. Um, and ha Hakim is also working on other projects as well around the history of anti-colonial struggle um, on the continent in Africa. Is that that's correct? Okay. Thank you, Hakim. Uh, <laughs> um, so Hakim has also he's published three history books for children, um, as well as many of the publications that he's done um, in, on an academic context. He developed a very important History Matters initiative and the History Matters Journal. And he was one of the founders of the Young Historians Project. And tonight, um, Hakim will be talking about his book, The History of African and Caribbean People in Britain, um, which I think has, as he, will, as he will talk about, there's always been the very simplistic idea that black British history started with the Windrush, right? In 1948. It's like that. That's where black British history started. Um, and I think... Um, Hakim's work demonstrates that actually from the very beginning that human beings first stood on this sceptered rainy isle, um, there have been African and Caribbean men and women at the heart of Britain. And that's one of the key messages from Hakim's research. So without further ado, I'll shut up and get out of the way and hand over to Professor Hakim Adim. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you so much uh, to Paul and um, the team here at the Africa Center. It's very good to be with you. And thank you all for coming out on such a cold Thursday evening in December. Hi. Today is the 1st of December, which is the anniversary of the launch of my book. 
it's been out now for two months. Um, there, it's clear that it's a book which is of interest to people um, up and down the country from Faversham to Edinburgh and beyond. And I'm very pleased to say something about it tonight. It's, um, some people would say, unfortunately, a rather large book, covers about 10,000 years of history. I don't have long enough tonight to um, present the entire history to you, obviously. So what I'm going to do is just to show some images from the book. The book contains over 50 different images. Again, I won't have time to show you all of those images, but I'll show a few and use those to illustrate some of the contents of the book. Okay, so my first picture is, uh, I'm not going back 10,000 years tonight because of uh, time constraints. So I'm just going to take you back about 1,700 years, 17 or eight, roughly 1,700 years to Roman times. And this is a reconstruction of a woman who lived in this country about 1700 years ago and it's taken from the latest kind of DNA evidence that we have and there is quite a lot of evidence of that kind and it shows an African woman, young African woman who lived and died in the city of York as I say around about 1700 years ago. There are similar finds in London and other cities. We don't necessarily have pictorial reconstructions of all of them. Um, but what we know of that period is that African men, women, and children lived throughout this country. There were African soldiers, there were African women, there were African children, there were African emperors like Septimius Severus, who came from what is today Libya. There were African governors like Quintus Lollicus Urbicus, who came from what is today Algeria, and many others. Um, indeed, it's not, this is not really news, or shouldn't be news to any of us, really, but uh, it still is news, and people get, or some people get a little bit upset um, about it. I think only a few months ago, people were attacking me on, even created their own video on YouTube to attack me and say that I was brainwashing children because I wrote about Africans in Britain 30 years ago, I think, and one of the books I wrote for children. So this is just the history of Britain. It's, it's nothing um, peculiar about it or wonderful about it. This is just the history of this country. In fact, even before Roman times, there were Africans here, um, going back uh, centuries before that period. One of the problems about this period and early, we can say, British history, the early history of the British Isles, is there isn't very much research at the moment. And even that research that has been done um, is subject to various interpretations. In other words, it very often has a Eurocentric analysis, um, which kind of excludes Africans. So even when the remains of Africans are found, uh, they're not analyzed or they're not treated in such a way that we can uh, immediately see that history. But believe me, um, it's there. I should say that every century after the Roman occupation of Britain, that's during the, we can say during the, the Saxon period, if you like, during the Norman period, during the Middle Ages, there were always Africans in this country. Uh, we don't necessarily know the numbers, uh, because again, at the moment, this history is reliant on various archaeological finds, essentially skeletal remains that have been found. But in all of those periods I've just mentioned, so that is the period before 1500, <clears throat> you will find Africans in this country. Um, of course, if we go back 10,000 years, we find people who look like Cheddar Man. I haven't put Cheddar Man up just because of time, uh, but people who had dark skin, dark hair, who even the Daily Telegraph described as black Britons. That's 10,000 years ago. In fact, 10,000 years ago, everybody in Europe looked like that. 
Um, those people didn't come directly from Africa, but their ancestors came from Africa. Anyway, that is the early, uh, early history. I can say more about it if people are particularly interested. Just to give you an example, a couple of months ago there was a, um, a news item was released saying that a, a skeleton of a young girl had been found in, near Deal in Kent. And there was some analysis of this skeleton and of the, the conditions in which she was found because she was found buried with others and buried um, in a way that was customary at the time. And it was interesting that the, um, the archaeologists or one of those connected with the archaeological find was commenting on the way this young girl, I think she was seven or eight years old, was buried like everybody else in Kent at that time. Uh, what, why he or she, I think it was a he, thought that she should be buried in any other way, uh, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, there was some <laughs> DNA analysis of this young girl. And DNA analysis these days is, is, has become more precise. And so they trace the, the DNA of this young child back to West Africa. Uh, they narrowed it down. They said that she probably had Yoruba heritage, uh, meaning that probably her father or her grandfather had come from what is today Nigeria to this country in the 7th century. Exactly why they came, in what circumstances, how many, is unknown. But that's just a, a recent example of the antiquity of this history and the fact that these finds are being discovered all of the time. Okay, I'm going to move on to the 15th century, to the Tudor period, because there we have some pictorial representation of, a, of an actual African person who existed, who we know who he was and so on. And this is John Blank, who you can see in the middle of this uh, illustration. This is an illustration from 1511. And John Blank, as you can see, was a trumpeter in the employment of the, uh, the court of both Henry VII and Henry VIII. We know, obviously, we know his name. We know he was married. We know that he was a wage earner. We know how much he earned. We know that he was probably the first African to, he didn't actually go on strike, but he demanded a wage increase, which was successful and he was, his wages were increased in that period. He, we can say, is a representative for us of the several hundred Africans who were in Britain or were in England in Tudor time. So at the royal courts, court of Henry VII, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, also the Scottish court, um, but also in the country at large where people some who came directly from Africa, but probably most came from Europe, from Spain and Portugal, lived here, worked here, were crafts people, were needle makers, were basket makers, were, there were men, women, children, divers, servants, a whole range of occupations in that period. Um, so uh, we're used to perhaps seeing Tudor times presented in a, um, a particular way in films and television and so on. Uh, that is in a way in which Africans are absent, um, but they were very much present during that period. Okay, so, so we could say up until 1500 or thereabouts, roughly speaking, the relationship between Africa and Europe, I'm generalizing a little bit now, but the relationship between Africa and Europe was one of, um, uh, we can say one of inferiority and one of superiority. That is to say Europe was inferior to Africa in terms of its economic development, its political development and so on, generally speaking. And the best example of that is the fact that Africans ruled 
parts of Spain and Portugal in that period between the 8th century and the 15th century. Uh, and the fact that when Europeans developed the ability to, uh, to explore and particularly to sail beyond their own immediate borders and seas, they went to Africa uh, really searching for those things that they didn't have. The main things which Europe didn't have was bullion, meaning gold and silver, and things like spices, um, which are important for all kinds of things, not just to make things taste good, but to preserve things. And so on. Anyway, there are other reasons why Europeans began these voyages of exploration and discovery, so-called, so but those were the main reasons. After 1500, this relationship changed. Uh, for various reasons, I won't, won't go into at length now, but we begin to see the beginnings of uh, human trafficking um, and Africans being trafficked across the ocean, particularly to the American continent, um, but also being brought to this country. And this is an illustration from uh, the probably the 17th century, probably late 17th century, early 18th century. It's an illustration of a Scottish aristocrat, but we don't necessarily need to worry too much about who he was. Uh, but, but the interesting thing is that we do know who he was, whereas we don't know so much about the boy who's pictured in this picture with him. I don't know how well you can see this image but you can see that this young man is wearing a, a collar, uh, which was kind of quite typical of that period when African children, sometimes Indian children, but generally African children were held, we can say, uh, as pets in the homes of the <coughs> wealthy, the rich and powerful in this country. Um, so having an African servant or enslaved person was a, a sign of, of wealth. And if you had your portrait painted, you would want to display your wealth. And having an African child in the picture with you was one demonstration of that wealth. So this illustrates something which is sometimes forgotten about uh, in this country, which is that the human trafficking of African men, women, and children is something that happened within the borders of this country, not just outside it in the Caribbean or America and so on and so forth. So this is typical and by the 18th century, um, it was quite a common occurrence. I may go into it in more detail, um, depending on what my next slide is. I forgot what my next slide is. Oh yes, William Answer. So, um, William Anser gives us a good demonstration of how this relationship worked. And if you'll allow me, I'm going to tell you a little story about William Anser. William Anser was a good-looking young man from West Africa uh, who had a doting father uh, who wanted his son to be educated in Britain as doting fathers who have enough wealth in West Africa, even today, often do. So he sent William to be educated here. Um, I forgot to mention that he also happened, William's father, to be a human trafficker as well. So that's just a, an item which I'll come back to in a moment. Anyway, he was a very enlightened gentleman. So he sent his son to be educated here with a trustworthy uh, gentleman who, unfortunately, during the voyage, that gentleman decided that William was worth much more if he was kidnapped and sold into slavery. So that's what that gentleman did. And William was taken to Barbados, where he was enslaved and put to work as were many others. William's father eventually found out what had happened to his son and was rather upset. 
that his son had been kidnapped. He wasn't upset that other people's sons and daughters were kidnapped, uh, but he thought it very unreasonable that his own son should be treated in that way. So he immediately got in touch with his business associates in London, who were known as the Royal Africa Company. They were called the Royal Africa Company because they were a monopoly company established by the monarchy in this country. Their main trade, if that's the right word, was in human beings. They were human traffickers. They heard what William's father said, and he was an important human trafficker, so they immediately sent their emissaries to Barbados. They found William. They bought his freedom. They brought him to London. They took him to the tailors and had this rather nice suit of clothes made for him. He was accommodated in the house of the government minister responsible for human trafficking, who was known as the president of the Board of Trade. He stayed in Britain for some considerable time. His portrait was painted, as you can see. Somebody wrote a biography of him. He was taken to the theater, taken to the opera. Then he was a man about town, everybody knew him. And after a period of time, he was taken back to West Africa. His father was overjoyed to see him. And his father, uh, who had threatened the Royal Africa Company, that if his son was not brought back, there would be no more human trafficking from that part of West Africa, immediately said, OK, business can now resume and human trafficking can continue. So this is um, not an entirely unusual story. There are other examples of it. It demonstrates lots of things about the history of this country, um, as well as the history of parts of West Africa. One is that a relationship had been established because of the demands that Britain had for enslaved Africans particularly in the Caribbean, but also elsewhere in North America and so on. Um, it tells us something about the monarchy of this country. I know some of you are quite fond of the monarchy. Um, the monarchy in this country were the chief human traffickers. Everybody from Elizabeth Tudor to William Hanover, they were all human traffickers. All the biggest monopolies in human trafficking were royal monopolies. Royal Adventures in Africa, Royal Africa Company and others. William Hanover, who some of you may know as William IV, when he was William Hanover and people started to talk about abolishing human trafficking, he got up in the House of Lords and said, what do you mean abolishing? This is much too important for us. And so, uh, anyway, that's the history of this country. But this is, also has a royal connection because this portrait is taken from the personal collection of uh, King Charles, um, who maybe in order to, for propaganda purposes, knew that I was coming here tonight and said, Hakeem, you must show the people this picture from my royal collection. This is a, uh, as you can see, a trumpeter from one of the household regiments. And uh, today it's very unusual to have African bandsmen in one of the household regiments. A few years ago, I remember there was a gentleman who was enlisted, but he resigned. He said there was too much racism in those particular regiments. But here in the 18th century, it wasn't uncommon. And in fact, in most British regiments, there were African trumpeters, African drummers, and of course, African soldiers and African sailors as well. And if you go to Nelson's Column, for example, you look at the plaques around Nelson's Column, you'll see an African sailor in the death scene of Nelson. So this was common for Africans to participate in the, the wars that Britain fought. Um, certainly throughout the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, and so on. So this is a kind of, kind of typical of 
the history. And in the book, I go into some of these histories of who these soldiers and sailors were in much more detail, which I'm not going to do uh, tonight. Okay, well, <clears throat> as well as uh, soldiers, sailors, drummers, trumpeters, there were also, of course, African women who were here. Uh, we don't have that many images, but this is one that we do have. This woman has now become quite well known after the film that was made a few years ago. Her name was Elizabeth Dido Lindsay. She was the, the niece of the Lord Chief Justice of this country, Lord Chief Justice Mansfield, um, through a rather interesting family connection that I won't, I won't go into now. Um, so this is, and this is a portrait of her. It, it demonstrates to us, you could say, that Africans were to be found at almost every level of British society. Of course, most African women and most African men in the 18th century were poor. Many were enslaved or in a kind of servile status, but not all were. And one of the key characteristics of those who were you could say at the um, at the bottom of society, in the sense that they were they had very few rights. Um, they fought for those rights. They fought to liberate themselves, to uh, liberate themselves from the the slavery which they faced. And that's a very um, significant feature of this history in the 18th century. In the book, I go into it in much more detail. Um, but so many people men and women ran away um, from their owners, in inverted commas, um, that it, it forced, or they were forced to, or the owners were forced to uh, go through a whole series of court cases to try and establish that they had the rights of property over human beings. Um, and they never succeeded, uh, not in this country. They had those rights in the Caribbean and in the US elsewhere, but never, in, never completely in Britain. So it's quite an interesting history of struggle in that period. Okay, so this gentleman is probably the most famous of those Africans of the 18th century. His name is Alaudo Equiano. He's sometimes known as Gustavus Vassa. He was born around about the middle of the 18th century in what is today Nigeria. Um, and he's known as a writer, he was a best-selling writer of his own autobiography, of his autobiography. He was also an activist, a campaigner for uh, the ending of human trafficking, the human trafficking of Africans. So in, in this period, um, the late part of the 18th century, the what historians call the abolitionist movement, that is to say the campaign of people in this country to end the human trafficking of Africans, that campaign became, it's probably the biggest political campaign ever in Britain's history. I know you don't, no one's told you about it. and We don't hear about it in school and so on. But it, it actually involved millions of people. People signed petitions. They boycotted the consumption of sugar. They refused to take sugar in their tea and coffee and so on. It's probably the first campaign in which workers participated, women participated, everybody participated. It's so big that nobody's ever heard of it. And it tells you something very interesting about the history of this country and how it's presented. That some of the most important parts of it are completely hidden. What that campaign needed, uh, in particular, were the voices of Africans. Um, the Africans should speak for themselves, to give their own thoughts on these important issues. And Equiana was one of them. He was also a member of an organization called the Sons of Africa, a political organization that, again, campaigned for the rights of Africans and for an end to human trafficking. It wrote letters to the press and so on and so forth. And Interestingly, he was also a member of another organization known as the London Corresponding Society. And that organization was a, to use a, a phrase much beloved here in the Africa Center, that was a radical organization. 
fact, it was so radical it was banned by the government. And the London Corresponding Society fought for the rights of the working people of this country. And Equiano was a member. Not only was he a member, he, he actually lived with the secretary of that society, a man called Thomas Hardy. And Thomas Hardy, just to divert a little bit, it wasn't African, but actually Scottish, um, wrote to somebody who Equiano had put him in touch with. And he wrote to this gentleman and he said, I understand that you are, uh, I'm paraphrasing what he said. He said, I understand that you are a friend or you are an advocate for the rights of Africans. He said, I assume from that that you are also an advocate for the rights of English people. Uh, because if you are for the rights of one set of people, then you must be for the rights of everybody. So this is very advanced political thinking. If you're for the rights of one section of the people, you must be for the rights of all. And you must fight for the rights of all. And that's 18th century. Now we're in the 21st century. Some people still don't understand this very important political principle. So that was what Equiano and others were involved in during that period. And it's one of the reasons why uh, human trafficking was abolished in this country in 1807. That's a much bigger story, which I also comment on the book. I'm not going to go into it um, now. Okay, well, keeping on with this kind of radical tradition, um, I introduce you to William Davidson. William Davidson was originally from Jamaica, was a cabinet maker, as you can see from this image, and he's no noted for um, conspiring with others to get rid of the government of this country. Uh, again, in the book, I give you some of the context for that. This was a period, the early part of the 19th century, where, of course, working people in this country at that time did not have the vote. They had very few rights. Um, and the rights that they demanded were uh, being suppressed. This is a period after what's known as the Peterloo Massacre. Some of you may have heard of that school. Or you may have seen the film. I don't know. Uh, the Peterloo Massacre was a demonstration in Manchester, which was suppressed with many people being killed and injured. And so people said, look, this is what our government is like. They don't respect the rights of ordinary people. We haven't got any rights. When we try and agitate for them, they kill us and arrest us and so on. So people, some people became very desperate. And they said, what we need is a, a sign. We need to do something and that everybody will rise up. And they, they thought, what we need to do is to assassinate the cabinet as you do. Uh, so that's what they planned to do. Unfortunately, that conspiracy was infiltrated by the police. Uh, William Davidson was implicated in it and executed for his uh, attempts. Um, and he was one of the last people to be <coughs> publicly executed in this country for that, taking part in that conspiracy. Good-looking young man. There are others. Uh, again, we haven't got time to go in, but because Zainab's here, we have to mention William Cuffey. William Cuffey, another of these uh, radical gentlemen, born in Chatham in Kent, the son of a man, sailor from St. Kitts, and a local woman. And William Cuffey is actually quite an important political figure in the 19th century because he became one of the leaders of the Chartists, the Chartists being the first national working class organization in this country. They were called the Chartists because they had a charter of six demands for the rights of ordinary people, particularly the right to vote, the right to vote, the right to stand for election, for annual parliaments, and so I can't remember the other three now. But William Cuffey was one of the leaders of the Chartists in London. He was a tailor, and he was a, a well-known figure fighting for the rights of ordinary people in this country. Eventually arrested and transported to Australia, as many, not just political people, but ordinary people who were 
arrested for minor offences were often transported to Australia in those days. And so he ended his life um, in Australia, where he's also well known, because he also fought in Australia as well. So that's William Coffey. Uh, no, we're leaving out. That's, I'm leaving out. Well, I, I wanted to show something. I didn't want to show a picture of uh, Sir Bartman. Um, but this is, a, as you can see, this is a poster advertising the exhibition of Sarah Bartman, who was a South African woman, who was exhibited as a, a freak, I suppose is the best way of describing her. Uh, Africans were, and other people were, exhibited in the 19th century. In fact, Africans were exhibited even in the 20th century in this country at things like the Empire Exhibition at Wembley. But this is 19th century, and you probably know the story of Sarah Bartman, or have heard of her. She was exhibited not very far away in Piccadilly. This one is from uh, the Midlands. But what I found very interesting about it is you can see here that the way they advertise it, she has had the honor of being visited by their royal highnesses, the Princess Elizabeth, the Prince Regent, and other branches of the royal family. So not that I'm anti-monarchy in any way, I don't want anyone to get that impression, but it just goes to show <laughs> what the monarchy is all about in this country, that uh, all the most uh, kind of reactionary things that you can do, uh, that, that's what they've done and continue to do. Um, anyway, I'll, I won't say any more about the monarchy, I promise. Um, <clears throat> yes, anyway, and I, I wanted to say something about, have some, some images of women. Um, this is Fanny Eaton. Now, Fanny Eaton is very interesting because she is a, a useful portrait of a, a poor working woman originally from Jamaica in the 19th century. Normally speaking, we don't have images of working people generally, whether they're black or white. Uh, but we have an image of her. She was a, um, a laundress, a washerwoman, a seamstress. She had 10 children. She was widowed. She was very poor. Um, and she remained poor throughout her whole life. But we, haven't, we have images of her because she posed as an artist model. And she was one of the favorite models of the pre-Raphaelites, Paul, I'm sure, will tell us all about, if we want to know about them. Um, uh, and so she appears in some of the paintings of the pre-Raphaelite artists, um, and also in their sketches. And this is just one of those sketches. Um, so again, finding images of women it's always more difficult than finding images of men. So even the kind of the archive in general that we look for as historians is kind of anti-women, you could say, or not gender sensitive in that sense. Um, but anyway, she's a good illustration of a poor black woman in the 19th century. Now we go to the opposite extreme, as it were, almost. Um, we have Sarah Forbes Bonetta, I understand a film is about to be made about her, um, who was a, her name was Aina. Um, she was a, um, she came from, she was a Yoruba woman, essentially, um, from West Africa, who was adopted by Queen Victoria. And, I mean, Queen Victoria did adopt they both have interesting stories, I suppose. Um, Sarah Forbes Bonetta was uh, rescued or kidnapped, depending on how you look at it, um, and then named after the boat that she was transported in. Um, but anyway, she essentially became a ward of Victoria. She was educated mainly in Sierra Leone. Um, she 
is she illustrates a number of things. What one of them is the that Britain, after being the world's leading human trafficker in the 18th century, became the world's leading uh, you can say abolitionist in the 19th century. So the British government used the, we can call it the suppression, or what they call the suppression of slavery, as a, a justification, as an excuse for interfering in African affairs. And in fact, largely speaking, the, the conquest and invasion of West Africa was mainly undertaken um, in the guise of suppressing the slavery which Britain had encouraged for the previous 200 years, yes. Um, uh, whether that was in what became the Gold Coast or in Lagos or throughout the whole coast, uh, every, everything was done with that justification. Um, and the British Navy patrolled those shores, established its ports um, at various places, um, and interfered in the entire shipping of the Atlantic. So as part of that, part of the work of that anti-slavery squadron resulted in this young woman being taken from West Africa um, and brought to this country. In the book I tell the whole story, but I'm just giving you the, the outline of it. Um, so yes, yeah, so a film is about to be made, a Hollywood film or film. So everybody will hear Sarah Forbes Bonetta. So here we have another Victorian gentleman. Um, this man's name is Jules Celestine Edwards, originally from the Caribbean, who uh, lived in Britain and is, was well known throughout the length and breadth of this country as a uh, kind of lay preacher we can say. Uh, he was many things. He was a lay preacher, a uh, devout Christian. He also spoke on themes that I know Paul won't like, like temperance being one of them, uh, which was pop popular at the time, but appears to be unpopular in the Africa Center tonight. Uh, but even more interesting than his devotion to temperance was his devotion to anti-racism and anti-imperialism. And he became perhaps the first, one of the first, we can say one of the first black people to be a, an editor of a, a national publication. He was actually editor of two publications. Um, one, um, an anti-racist publication of this period. So I'm talking about the latter part of the 19th century uh, called Fraternity. He also edited a a magazine called Lux. So he was in contact or in, in worked in concert with the anti-racists of that period. He, he was also a very um, fierce opponent of British imperialism in Africa, British intervention in Africa, and so on. And so he was, he was many things. And he, one of the things he did was to write a book called Hard Truth, which was it's presented as a conversation between Christ and the devil on the subject of racism in Britain, which is quite an unusual thing for a Christian to do, I would have said. Anyway, good-looking young man, so um, I used his image for another book, which is also out. And if you're interested in reading this conversation between Christ and the devil, you can find an extract in this book available in all good bookshops, as they say. Okay, so I'm getting towards the end of the 19th century. Well, again, another interesting figure, the famous classical composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was born just down the road in Croydon in 1870. And Samuel Coleridge Taylor was interesting. I mean, a kind of child prodigy, I suppose, as a musician, um, much thought of at the time as the new great British classical composer. 
Um, unfortunately, died at a very early age. He was still in his 30s. He's best known for his choral work. Yes, Laverne, I know you like choral works. Uh, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, which is still available, I think. But he wrote for piano. Uh, in fact, he wrote for a range of instruments. Um, he, um, he worked with Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You heard of him? Some educated people have. But, um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was an African-American poet. Why, why are you laughing? african -American. Yeah, some educated people have heard of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Some uneducated people haven't. There's nothing in crime in that. Paul, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was an African American writer, poet. Some of you will have heard the phrase, I know why the cage bird sings. You heard of that? Yeah. Okay, well, that's Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote those words, which were stolen later by somebody else from the title of a book. So he worked with Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He was well known in the US. He performed at the White House. And interestingly, he was also another political figure, a Pan-Africanist who composed the music for the first Pan-African conference, which was held in London in 1900, just down the road in Westminster Hall. And in fact, he became one of the kind of key figures at that conference. So a very interesting uh, man in this period at the, the turn of the century. And he was, anyway, I could say more, but I just to um, say a little bit. So the 20th century, I'm now going into the 20th century, is, is interesting because we find, um, of course, we, we are in the period of colonial rule in Africa as well as in the Caribbean. And we find many more people coming to this country as students from those places. And this young man is uh, an example. This is um, one of my favorite photos. This is roughly about 1908, <coughs> something like that. This guy's name was Bandele Omoni. He came from what is today Nigeria, what was then Nigeria, um, as a student. He studied at the University of Edinburgh. But he didn't stay as a student for long because it was said that he was too concerned about political matters. He's perhaps chiefly known because he wrote a book called A Defense of the Ethiopian Movement, which is a sort of early um, sort of pan-African book, you can say, where he discusses a whole range of things. Um, he was active with various organizations that have been formed amongst students in this country. The 20th century is a period of when many organizations are being formed, amongst students as well as others, and people, Africans, people of African heritage, being concerned about their rights in one form or another. Um, so then he, anyway, later he, he came also to the attention of the government, the colonial office kind of monitored his activities as they did uh, with many student activists afterwards. And he later went to Brazil where he was imprisoned and he died at the age of 27, so not long after this picture was taken. So he's a very interesting guy. He's the first, first person I ever wrote about as a young historian a long, long time ago. Okay, so uh, moving on to the years just before the First World War, we find this gentleman, and he's important. His name was Dusse Muhammad Ali. He was said to be, or well, he said he was Egyptian, Egyptian Sudanese. He's known to us today as the editor of a paper called the African Times and Orient Review. Uh, people think the voice is the first paper or something like that. Uh, uh, people were producing papers in the 19th century. But his paper, or really magazine, journal, was founded in 1912. And it ran 
with slight interruptions because it was banned by the government during the First World War, but it ran until 1920. Um, it, as its title suggests, it was interested in not just Africa, but the East, we, we could say, I suppose, or it, they would have said the Orient at that time, meaning North Africa, Western Asia, the Islamic world. Um, Dusa Muhammad Ali was a Muslim and was very concerned with the rights of Muslims um, internationally. A very interesting guy. He was in touch with kind of everybody, all the key political figures of the day. Marcus Garvey, who some of you may have heard of, uh, worked for him uh, as a journalist for a short time. Later on, he went to the US and was involved with, with Garvey and others. Later, later still, he went to Nigeria and was an important newspaper editor there. So he's a very interesting guy. But he's, again, representative of um, the concerns that many people had during this period to um, write about, speak about the injustices that Africans and others faced um, in the world. His, his journal was also interesting in that it had, or it was about to have one of the first black beauty contests. Um, I understand beauty contests have come back in vogue again. You can, you can now talk about them without fear of anybody attacking you. Um, but anyway, he was one of the first. He didn't actually launch it eventually for various reasons, but he planned a black beauty contest. In, I can't remember where, 1917 or something. I can't remember. Anyway, during that period. Okay, well, it's always good to say something about Tottenham. So, um, so this is Walter Daniel Toll who was a star striker, I suppose you'd call him today, for Spurs in the period before the First World War. He is noted for being one of the first black footballers. Uh, he was born in Folkestone, in Kent. But he's perhaps better known now as for his exploits during the First World War. In those days, one of the features of the 20th century in particular um, was that racism became very prevalent in this country, more so than it probably was in the 19th century or the 18th century. And there was something called a color bar, which meant that if you were a person of color, you were barred from doing various things. And one of the things you were barred from doing was being an officer in the army. If you were not a person of pure European descent, you could not become an officer. Now, in fact, during the First World War, that color bar was partially dropped in a number of cases. Um, not very many, but a few cases. Um, because there were some parts of the army, like if you were a doctor in the army, you automatically became an officer. And it, became, it was difficult to discriminate against black doctors anyway, but uh, though there were attempts to do that. But he is unusual in that he's the first British-born person, a black person, to become <laughs> an officer. He was a second lieutenant, uh, largely because of his fame as a sportsman. Uh, so he fought throughout the First World War and was killed at the Second Battle of the Somme in 1917. There is a campaign ongoing uh, because he was, um, what's the word, not awarded, but he was, uh, it was, he was about to be awarded the military medal. Um, and then he died. Now, according to army regulations, you can't be, apparently, you can't be awarded the military medal posthumously although some people have been. Uh, and you certainly can't be awarded it if you're called Walter Daniel Toll. So there is a campaign that the military medal should be awarded to him, as it has been to others who were killed in action. Uh, but at the moment, 
Um, there seems to be no sign of that happening. So yes, people often make a big fuss, particularly in the First World War, that it was a war in which people from different parts of the world can, uh, participated, fought, and died, of course. And that is true. Um, but we give less um, prominence to those who fought against the war. Because the war was a, some would call it an imperialist war, radical people at the Africa Center would call it that, a war to redivide the world amongst the big powers, Britain, France, and others. And so some people fought against it. And I haven't got my Isaac Hall slide, but one of those who fought against the war was a man called Isaac Hall, who was a Jamaican. And in those days, people who refused to be conscripted into the army were known or were labeled conscientious objectors, which meant that you objected to military service on the basis of your conscience. Um, but even though that might be your conscience, you could be uh, arrested. And Isaac Hall was arrested, imprisoned, in, I think in Pentonville, tortured. <clears throat> But he refused to renounce his principles. And in, his, in the words that are attributed to him, he explains why. And the reason he said was because he was a, an oppressed person. And why should he fight for his oppressors um, in a war that was between one gang of oppressors against another gang of oppressors? Um, and so he had a very clear idea of what the war was about and refused to participate. There were many others who did that. In Africa, the most famous being a gentleman called John Chilembwe, who is now the national hero of Malawi, and led a, an uprising against conscription against the war and so on. So those people who fought against the war are as important, if not more important, than those who fought in it. Okay, I better speed up because uh, I think we're running out of time. So let's just very, very quickly. So I mentioned some of the organizations formed during the 20th century, that there were many. This is one of the earliest. This is the Nigerian Progress Union from 1924, formed in London in that time. It's jointly formed by two people. I won't mention the guy sitting on the right. The woman in the left, though, wasn't even exactly Nigerian. She was a woman called Amy. Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey. But she co-founded this organization. And there she is a few years later, this time addressing a demonstration at Trafalgar Square. This is a demonstration opposing the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. So Amy Ashwood Garvey was a very prominent political activist here from the 1920s up until the 19. Uh, 50s, where she, some of you know, she organized with Claudia Jones and so on. And here's another picture from the 1930s, again on the same subject, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. This one's actually, <coughs> actually taken from Cardiff, and it's a, an anti-war demonstration, anti-war and anti-fascism, again from that period, because this was a very important uh, issue for people, Ethiopia being the only Oh, yeah, the only independent African country and certainly the only one to defend its independence um, through military means. Okay, so the Second World War, well, I talked about a color bar during the 20th century, and this color bar existed throughout the Second World War in the armed forces, but also in the auxiliary services and forces like the Land Army. So Amelia King was born in East London and tried to join the Land Army, uh, which was a, a scheme to, for women to help in agriculture. And she was refused entry. And it created a, a big campaign, as you can see uh, from this poster, of people saying, well, what is this war being fought for? Isn't it supposed to be a war against racism, fascism, and so on? And it also mentions later, further down, Leary Constantine, the famous cricketer and later peer of the realm, who suffered a kind of similar uh, 
he actually was barred from a hotel in Russell Square with his family during the war when he was actually working for the government. And that also became a very big case. So these are just examples of the fact that people not only contributed to the Second World War, but overcame all kinds of obstacles and racism to do so. Okay, well, uh, this is another example of the things people did during the Second World War. This woman's name is Ademola Ademola. She was a nurse from Nigeria. She, um, anyway, there are many things I could say about her. The, the most prominent is that a film was made about her life which has now been lost, unfortunately. So we, know, we only have some stills like this one from the film. But she trained here in London as a nurse and as a midwife. She was a member also of this organization, the West African Students' Union, which Paul mentioned is his introduction. And here we see them pictured outside their hostel in the 1940s. The hostel's in Camden. The house is still there. You can go and spot it in South Villas, if anybody wants to go there. This was one of, they had about four hostels eventually. They set up these hostels because the colour bar meant that it was very difficult to find accommodation. And if you did find it, you would be charged a higher rate. People called it the colour tax. So in order to prevent that, they, went, they sent their general secretary to Africa to raise money. And when he came back, they opened their first hostel in Camden. This is actually the second hostel. Um, anyway, so a very important organization, and people would come here for food. They had, long before the Africa Center had a restaurant, the West African Students Union had a restaurant, and they called their hostels Africa House. So people in Africa Center should know the history of these things. Go back to the 1930s, actually, before. Because the, the plan to have a center for Africans in London goes, actually goes back to the period before the First World War. You knew that, though, I don't know. Okay, so 1945, we have the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress, formed by, or convened by 14 organizations in this country, uh, under the umbrella of the Pan-African Federation. On the platform, again, you can see Amy Ashwood Garvey, one of the organizers of this in very, very important Congress. I suppose today it's better known in Africa than it is here in Britain, although the Manchester people generally celebrate it. And without going into everything, you get an idea of the politics of this period from uh, the slogans, the placards, Arabs and Jews unite against British imperialism, down with anti-Semitism, oppressed peoples of the world unite, and one I particularly like, labor in the white skin cannot emancipate itself while labor in the black skin is enslaved, which, as everybody knows, is a quote from Das Kapital, written by a German gentleman, Mr. Marx. So anyway, lots could be said about that. It, people like uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Hastings Banda, Abofemi Awolowo, and others all attended this very famous Congress, which set out a vision of a new Africa, a liberated Africa. We can leave that one. Um, very good looking young men. So I better say something about them. Um, these are the Turpin brothers. And as you can see, they're all boxers. Um, the best known of them is Randolph Turpin. You heard of him? No. Okay, or some have. You heard of Sugar Ray Robinson? Okay, well, Randolph Turpin beat Sugar Ray Robinson to become a uh, middleweight champion of the world. But actually, the one who's more important for us is Lionel Jr., who is known as Dick in the family. And he is famous, and I never know which is which, because I get them mixed up. But anyway, Dick, in 1948, became the first black boxer to win a British title, um, because in the period before 1948, there was a color bar in boxing. And if you were a black boxer, you couldn't fight for a British title. So that was broken by Dick Turpin in 1948. 
Okay, we can leave that one. Well, this is a Birmingham, this actually is a national paper, Caribbean Labour Congress paper, Caribbean News. This is just a kind of interesting article from Birmingham, again about the colour bar, because this is something that people protested about for years. Um, and Henry Gunter, Henry Gunter is actually this good looking young man here. This is a picture of an organisation in Birmingham in that period. Okay, well, this is from the 1960s, and it's a photo of Claudia Jones in the middle here, who's well known to most, I, su I suppose. Um, it's actually a demonstration against the 1962 Immigration Act, which was the, the first of those po openly racist post-war immigration acts, which, um, anyway, is quite important. So she and others campaigned against, and of course she's known for establishing the West Indian Gazette for campaigning against in the, in the aftermath of the uh, racist attacks in Notting Hill in 1958 and for lots of other things as well. A uh, former communist in the US who was deported to Britain. Anyway, could say much more, but time's running and passing. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the 70s. Now, one of the things about the 70s was um, the, I suppose you'd call it campaign, which was launched in the media against muggers, muggers being a, a name for young black men. Um, and mugging was the, the crime of street robbery. So in the 1970s, there was a press campaign which, which basically presented the view that all young black men were potential muggers and therefore could be and should be apprehended by the police. So this particular famous case dates from uh, 1972 when four young men came out of Oval Tube Station just up the road and were attacked by a gang and they defended themselves from that gang. In the course of that defense, it turned out that the gang of men were, were police officers. So the four were arrested, charged with various bogus offenses, beaten up, tortured, and eventually sentenced for those bogus offenses. And some of them served quite lengthy prison sentences. Winston True, I think, was in prison for two years. Um, so the, the point about this is, this is obviously there was a campaign, a kind of community campaign in which Zainab and others were involved, uh, which was typical of that time. There were many similar cases, not just in London, but up and down the country. This one is unusual in the sense that Winston, I suppose we could say campaign for the next 50 years to clear his name and the name of his uh, his friends, and then almost by accident, uh, another case was being heard in which it emerged, you could say, that the police officer responsible leading this and many, and many similar cases was, uh, to say corrupt is a, doesn't really mean much when you're talking about the police, but um, was known to be corrupt in the sense that he actually ended up in prison, unlike most. That fact had obviously been known to the police and the Home Office for many, many years, but they decided not to disclose it. But the fact that it emerged in another court case, and the person involved in that court case got in contact with Winston, meant that he had the possibility to clear his name. And so, whatever it was, two years ago, after 50 years of he was completely exonerated um, from that uh, conviction. So there's, anyway, a lesson to be learned there by somebody. Um, one thing is never give up. Two is never trust the police. Um, anyway. And now it's almost become fashionable to say that the police, uh, particularly the Metropolitan Police, are racist and homophobic and misogynist, isn't it? You have to say that. Even the police say it now. So yes, of course we are. Um, but this was people were saying this 
example, because like we were saying this 50 years ago, and people generally had a different view. The police saying, no, how dare you? Anyway, times change. Uh, well, another, I guess another big problem of the 70s was the problems that people faced in schools and so on. This is a typical headline from Grassroots, the publication of the Black Liberation Front, which was another important organization of the 1970s, of which Zainab, sitting here, was, one, was a leading member. I won't say any more about you. Um, but it, it was one of several organizations. In the book, I present this as a kind of a British black power era and talk about the other organizations and what they did and who was involved and so on and so forth. I won't do that now. So moving through the 1970s, this was another feature of the 1970s, and this is a picture from Birmingham, from Handsworth. But that every May the 25th, we, or particularly those who are involved in political organizations, we celebrated Africa Liberation Day. Um, and this is a particularly big celebration. Um, but these manifestations were held in various cities in the, in the 70s and in the 80s. And this is, was a particularly big one in Handsworth, uh, which is captured. But it, what it illustrates is the... Uh, the connection that people made between the oppressive regimes in Africa and the oppression which people faced in this country during that period. Today, things are you know, a bit different. It's not even called Africa Liberation Day anymore. So 1980s. This is 1981, the uh, Black People's Day of Action, which came in the aftermath of the New Cross massacre, as it was called in those days, um, in which uh, 13 young people were killed in a fire in um, New Cross. And as you can see, or maybe you can't quite see from here, yes, you can, but you can, that 13 dead, nothing said was one of the slogans of that period. And it was particularly important because it highlighted the fact that in the capital of the country, 13 young people could be killed in, shall we say, suspicious circumstances. Um, and nobody officially said anything. Um, and not to say anything about the monarchy in particular, but the queen of that time uh, said absolutely nothing about this tragic, tragedy. And then a few weeks later, there was a, uh, there was actually a fire in Dublin, which is in another country. Um, and the Queen immediately sent a telegram of condolence, um, but hadn't, hadn't and didn't and never sent one in this country to her own citizens. So anyway, that was one of the features. So how, who, how many people here were, were there in that day? Anybody besides me? Kathleen, genius? Okay, three of us. Okay. Somebody should interview us, maybe. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is my second to last slide. And this is on the right, my friend, Aji, who I went to university with many years ago. And us with her son, Shenny. And... Um, so 12 years ago, uh, yes, 12 years ago, Shenny was um, feeling unwell and was admitted to a hospital um, as, a, as an outpatient. He, he was undergoing some emotional crisis or mental health. He was a student uh, in his early 20s. Anyway, he was admitted as an outpatient, meaning that you, when you're an outpatient, you can go out um, and leave and so on. Anyway, he asked to leave the hospital and was denied that right. And the, those who were caring for him decided that he shouldn't be allowed to leave 
the hospital. And they called the police to restrain him. And I, I don't know exactly how many, 11 or 12 police officers arrived. And they uh, killed Jenny. So, um, and to this day, um, nobody has been brought to a book, held accountable for that uh, death. In fact, it wasn't until recently, with the murder of Dalian Atkinson, some of you may remember, the former footballer, that any police officer gets held to account um, for the, actually for the death in that sense. So that was the first case. So Aji and her family have campaigned. They've got a law passed, which is known as Shenny's Law, which is supposed to protect people in um, secure environments, as it were, um, from those um, from death at the hands of the police. Uh, whether it will is another matter. But they've campaigned and continue to campaign um, that someone should be held to account. So this is the reason I use this slide. In the book, I go into more details about other cases because there are many other cases. It's just one um, that I happen to, about somebody I happen to know. Um, but there were many, many other cases. And they um, reflect something about the country, the society in which we live, which is an important part of the history of that society, that we should not hide it or sweep it under the carpet, but talk about it openly and um, point the finger where it should be pointed. And that brings me to 2020, which is where the book ends, with the unprecedented um, protests of people up and down the country from Land's End to John O'Groats over a variety of issues, some of them to do with racism, with police violence, with police death, with deaths in police custody, some of them about history and about how the history of this country is presented and how the history of people of African and Caribbean heritage in this country is presented or misrepresented. And uh, hopefully the book go some way to redress those imbalances, those misrepresentations, that disinformation which has been presented. So that's it. That's what I have to say.